Good afternoon, everybody. If you don't know me, my name is Richard McCabe. I'm the photo curator here at the Ogden. Thanks for coming this afternoon. Y'all are in for a treat because uh, we have Scott Matthews and Ramel Ross in a curated conversation, um, and it's going to be amazing. And this is programming of with the Ramel Ross Spell Time Practice American Body, the work of Ramel Ross exhibition. So if y'all haven't seen the show, I think we might uh, wander up there after the talk a little bit, but it's a must see. It's, it's such an amazing show. And um, Ramel Ross made most of the work for this exhibition. And uh, it's his photographs from a South County, a Hell County series and new sculptural works and video works. Um, so I'm just going to introduce y'all. Uh, Scott Matthews is a scholar, writer, and assistant professor of history at Florida State College in Jacksonville, Florida. Matthews is the author of Capturing the South, Imagining America's Most Documented Region, which was published in 2018 by the University of North Carolina Press. And it's available in our bookstore. <laughs> and it's great. It's a little little of a slog there for a while there, Scott, but it opens up in the... <laughs> and, and I told you that before, and, and you took it like a man, but uh, my, my favorite, there's two great chapters that I really loved, and one is called What, is, what a Place This South Is, about Jack Delano's Farm Security Administration photographs in Greene County, Georgia, and also the chapter on Hell County, where you go way beyond William Christenberry and Walker Evans. And then we have the great Ramel Ross. And Ramel is a visual artist, filmmaker, writer, and liberated documentarian. His work has appeared in places like the Hammer Museum, uh, Birmingham Museum of Art, Museum of Modern Art, National Gallery of Art, and the Ogden Museum of Southern Art, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, um, Ramel's film, experimental film, Hell County This Morning, This Evening, won a special jury award for creative vision at the 2018 Sundance Film Festival and the 2020 Peabody Award. It was nominated for an Oscar at the 91st Academy Awards and an Emmy for Exceptional Merit in Documentary Film. Ramel holds degrees in sociology and English from Georgetown University, and he is the associate professor of art at Brown University. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Ramel Ross and Scott Matthews. Thank you all for coming on a Saturday afternoon. I know that um, I am in very grateful just to be asked to be here and um, be s sitting next to this man, an artist. Um, the format here is going to be pretty free-flowing. Um, Ramel and I first met on a Zoom chat with Richard and Amy Newell's joining us, and we were talking about the exhibit and the possibility of us having a conversation. And then Ramel and I hijacked the conversation for 45 minutes, <laughs> and it seemed to go all right, and so I think Richard maybe felt inspired to ask us to come back. So I know that all of you do not want to hear me talk about capturing the South. You want to hear Ramel talk about his work. And so the format is going to be roughly this. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly at the beginning about my book and about some of the themes, particularly as it relates to the history of documentary work in Hale County. And then that is going to be a kind of a jumping off point for Ramel to talk about his own work. So. I'll kind of justify my existence here a little bit by talking about the book, and then I hope um, have an, an in-depth conversation with Ramel, and then hopefully maybe questions. Yeah, a lot of questions. Questions would be good. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we want it not just to be all watching us, yeah. us talk. And also, I feel like we can, um, because we're so interested in the exact same thing, we can, in, we can just talk about that abstractly or not abstractly and be in it. But I think what's, what's most interesting to me most times when I'm, when I'm like listening to people talk is uh, for them to engage with the folks who have questions based on their relationship to the place and to the art and to the stuff and to their ideas so that you don't leave being like, well, that was interesting, but I really don't remember one thing or there was this one interesting line, something that's like, yeah, that actually makes sense to me based on my own experience. So 
we would love it if you all um, jumped in. Absolutely. All right, so Richard was um, mentioning my book, and it, it is indeed a little bit of a slog. It's an academic book. Um, no one in my family will admit to actually having read it cover to cover, but <laughs> hopefully um, some of you might. Um, I know it's for sale here, although in hardbacks it's a little expensive. But in short, um, the, my book is about the history of the documentary tradition in the American South um, during the 20th century. And one of the premises of the book is that a lot of scholars, um, art critics, sociologists, and others have called the American South the most documented place on earth. And so I began kind of thinking about, well, why is this so? Why is this the case? What has attracted, going back really not just in the 20th century, but to the origins, the colonial origins of the Americas themselves, that the southern region was in many ways constructed through firsthand eyewitness documentary fieldwork. It begins as travel writing, it evolves into sketch art and then lithography and photography and film and sound recording and the tradition is as vibrant today as it ever was. And so I wanted to kind of create a, as much as I could a comprehensive history by focusing on some really important documentarians and important themes. I mean, I should mention here that when I was writing my chapter on Hale County, which is what I'm gonna base my questions to Ramel on, um, I was in the process of revising my work on Hale County when I learned about Ramel's photography. And it was just too late in the game. If I'd tried to convince my editor to write more, um, they probably would have cut ties with me, so I couldn't talk about Ramel in the, in the book itself, but had it been just a couple years later, um, he would have figured prominently towards the end um, as a kind of culminating point. But it's been fascinating now to, to think back on this history and to think of it in light of the radical work that Ramel is doing. Um, I hope if you haven't, you get to see this exhibit today. Um, I, I, today I was in a bookshop in the French Quarter. I was looking at a cross an Emily Dickinson book, and it put me in mind of what I felt last night. Dickinson once said something to the effect, um, if you feel as though the top of your head has been taken off, that is poetry. And I felt like my head was taken off physically last night um, by what I saw in the work there. Um, well, and thanks, so man. I hope you all have that same felt experience. So, Ramel, I want to begin by talking about something that when people talk about the history of documentary in the South, but specifically in Hale County, um, they talk about the creation of a cosmos. Mm. They talk about the creation of a place by documentary art, by documentary expression. Um, when writing about Hale County's documentary history, I oftentimes heard people who come into the county who aren't from Hale County they feel as though they have driven into an open-air exhibit that they are physically seeing Walker Evans's art or William Christomery's art kind of hung from the landscape itself. And that there's a sense that you're entering a place that has been constructed through documentary rather than the lives of the people who live there. And in my essay, writing about Ramel's work, I talked about this as a kind of spell I think Ramel and I use spell in different ways when thinking about the exhibit, but I thought of spell in this sense, and that is that Hale County has become a kind of symbol for many ways of how people perceive the South and perceive race. And when talking about the history of Hale County, and you're talking about the history of documentary expression, when you look at it from a long view, that Hale County, before there was Walker Evans and William Christenberry, became famous because of a woman named Martha Strudwick Young and a photographer named George Washington Otts. Um, Martha Strudwick Young was basically Alabama's Joel Chandler Harris, and she collaborated with a local photographer, and they went throughout Hale County, and she was a member of the old Hale County aristocracy, and they photographed and took down stories of the black community in Hale County. And very patronizing photographs that fit squarely within the sort of romantic um, local color plantation school of literature at the time that portrayed black people as sort of these happy retainers. 
And that was the cultural, the dominant image. Hale County was a place tourists came to see the Old South, to see the white pillared mansions, to see the world created by Martha Strudwick Young and J.W. Watts, who had also a studio right there in Greensboro. And that, of course, then changes about 30 years later when the image of Hale County goes from being associated with images redolent of the Old South and happy and contented faithful retainers, the descendants of the slaves who once worked the cotton fields in a place like Hale County. It goes to then becoming a place synonymous with white poverty. Hale County becomes a place, because of Walker Evans's photographs and James Agee's prose, a place that becomes emblematic of not just poverty in the South, but vestiges of a kind of white folk culture enduring in an otherwise modernizing America. And really, from then up until Rommel's work, Hale County was a site of return, a long line of people. Um, Hal Raines from the New York Times, Dale Maharaj, and Michael Williamson, who wrote a book, and their children after them, a follow-up study of Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Um, it was, in many ways, a search for that Hale County, the Hale County imagined by Evans and Agee, one that was seen as white, despite the fact that Hale County's population had largely been a black majority. And so I give you that history in part because I, have, I think historically that way, but to emphasize the radical nature of what Ramel is doing, because formally, conceptually, it's radical, but also thinking about it historically and where he fits in. And so my first question to you, Ramel, is given that history, <clears throat> to what extent when you began to do work in Hale County, did that burden of the county's documentary history in any way, the, the, the kind of anxiety and if, of influence from Kristen Marrier Evans, was that something you considered? Was that a kind of baggage, or did you feel already liberated from that? Yeah, um, thanks for that introduction. It's actually not even nice to hear it in this moment. Um, the, the sort of trajectory of how we came to this point. I think, you know, the, inter the most interesting thing for me is that while I can I sound like an academic because, you know, at a point in my life I became like very self-conscious about not being extremely well-read and like I was at Georgetown and I got there on a scholarship and everyone else was interested in all these things and like someone saying a word and I'm like, I have no idea what that means. I like obsessed about becoming hyper-educated. And so um, I, when I got to Hell County, I was, it, it was just a place in the South to me, you know? I knew who Walker Evans was and who William Christianberry was. Um, my method of, of entering into the problem of photography is through my own experience as being a person who had, had been hyper um, controlled and my image like preceded me as an athlete, which was always super damaging to me because I, I like, always wanted to do photography or do some art stuff or like have quirky conversations and people would be like, oh, that's just the basketball player, like, or whatever. And that kind of like shut me down in a way and I just became like this really silent, observant person. And so when I got to Hell County and I started working with um, youth in, in the youth center I was working at, Youth Build, the, I started to photograph the students and I was like, oh, I can't let the camera do what the people had done to me, basketball. I can't let that happen. And then through, trying, through strategies of trying to figure that out, I became obsessed with the rabbit hole, which is the problem of representation, the problem of um, blackness in the context of representation, the tools, and then the history of the place. Um, and I became deeply aware of the way in which uh, the history of documentation had um, kind of curated the way in which I was making images. And so I made images in Hell County um, maybe arguably in the vein of uh, Walker Evans and William Christberry for like three years. Um, and it wasn't something that was conscious, it was something like, it was something that I would go out and I'd shoot for a couple hours at night or before uh, school or after and all of my images came back and they were just so disappointing, they just looked so familiar, you know? I had seen this before and, and I didn't like that. Um, and they were pretty and they were interesting and people would see them and they'd be like, oh, I know that place. <laughs> Or like, that light is gorgeous and it feels good and, and it does because that's what the South does to you. Right. It sort of l like lulls you or woos you with its, um, its almost, yeah, sort of transcendent aesthetic and heat and it's, it is a spell. 
Um, the spell is in the landscape and the spell is in the visuals and it's also in the history that preceded it. And so I made the first photo I made that was to what I would call groundbreaking for myself, um, not necessarily for other people, was called Dakisha and Marquise. Um, and it's one with Dakisha laying down on a porch and then there's a young child, her son, uh, Marquise, we call him man, in the background um, playing. And you know, most of my images take, take about 20, 25, 30 minutes to make because they're four by five, eight by 10, all this set up, and then you can't see through it while you're taking it, you have this, all these things. And so I remember the image that I had in mind of taking was Dakisha laying down and like kind of holding man, holding man upside down over her stomach. Um, and I don't know what that meant, but I knew that that was a gesture that was evocative in the context of interpreting um, what, it, what a person of color laying down. Like there's a lot of um, confusing symbolism in there. And I took that photo, I still have it, and she set Marquise down and he just like ran and started playing and Dakisha fell asleep. Um, it was hot, we were just, I was just like, just hold, just hang out, just, just like chill. And he went back there and started playing with flowers and I was just, and it was just, my, my frame was here and I was standing right here, but I had the, the shutter like in my hand. And there was just the, the contrast of, uh, of Marquise like so enveloped in these leaves and in this light that was coming through and Dakisha resting, but in a precariously resting position, right? Like who goes to sleep with their arms out like this um, was just like so evocative. And I just pressed it, didn't get to see the photo for another three weeks because it has to go off and be developed. And it came back and I was like, oh, I've never seen this before, you know? And then I started to consider Though, like working with symbolism, using, I like to say, using blackness as content, using skin as a provocative um, landscape of interpretation to suspend meaning in the context of blackness. Um, and then I also, I went to grad school around that time and really started to dig into the work of these two. Um, because I was like, oh, if I, if I had been doing this with photography, if I had been making images in their vein and I didn't know it, what else have I been doing that's based on someone else's vision of the world um, that I would like to figure out ways to not have be part of the, my language of art. That leads me to another question I want to raise in just a minute because, and I have mentioned this before, but I, I see your work not only as liberated documentary but as relational documentary. Mm -hmm. And one of the themes in this book, and it's not just within documentary expression in the South, it's kind of the history of anthropology or ethnographic encounters and ethnographic writing, which is to see a sort of the separation between the observer and the other. Um, that there's almost this empirical drive to document and to see something else and interpret the meaning of that object, rather than to see it in someone that you are directly and kind of deeply connected to. And so one of the things, um, Ramel, that I find striking about your work is that relational quality, and it seems maybe from your, your response there that that might have been intuitive, but that maybe was not initially what you were setting out to do, but from then on, one of the defining features of your work, at least it's the way I see it, is that there is a bond, there is a relationship, mm -hmm. and that you are seeing the people you work with and that you live with and that you love not as your subjects, mm -hmm. but as a community, as a family, and that they are as much the authors of the photographs as you are because there's that spirit of relation or collaboration. Yeah, um, and I love that. Uh, I love that language, and I, I'll, probably, I'll probably use it because I think, you know, I wrote down while you were, you were um, talking, and it's not necessarily rated, but like, like I'm not interested in what is. I'm interested in what could be or what could be imagined because um, it points to what is way more interestingly. Um, and I think when I'm working with my, my guys and hanging out and we're making images, it's, it's about like every image that I've made has its embedded meaning of my relationship with them in the image. So like I did all that stuff on purpose. Like I put the Keisha and I had man doing this because of the way that we had our relationship. Like I'm not going to give you the reasons, but there's deep, deep intention there in this kind of whimsical, almost chimerical thing. And within that, there is, it is impossible for anyone, of, anyone to, to come across that image and read it and come to the, the right idea.
you can't. It's not, it's not for you to come up with the right idea. It's for you to participate in the imagining of what it could mean. Um, and then, of course, it becomes a reflection of the person's experience and whatnot. And so um, relationship became the source of meaning for the images and also a way to make sure that I'm conscious of, um, I want to say, I mean, some of the photos are provocative and you could come to what one would call like negative associations, which is intentional. But I think um, the way in which there are like relationships are embedded are, are a way to, I think, you know, I don't, I don't really know. I, I like don't, I don't want you to have access to our relationship and have access to the folks in the images. I don't call them subjects. I not yell, but I get upset at my students when they call people who they're photographing or working with subjects because that's the language of science and that has been the problem of photography and the problem of documentation that it's a science and it isn't. Now it can be useful to science um, and it can, it can do a variety of things in those realms, but when we're talking about taking photos of people, once you start making those claims of absolution, um, which are constantly being revised in science, yeah, I feel like there's something lost about humanity um, in that process. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and I, I think, again, to appreciate, <laughs> I, I go back to this word because it's true, the, the radical nature of what Ramel is doing, it's also important to understand another facet of the history of documentary work in Hale County and, and then, by extension, the South. And one of the things I tried to emphasize, um, and I'll tell a story of how I came to this, because it wasn't initially through studying the history, although all the signs of it were there, it was their personal experience. Um, but one of the constant themes of documentary, in again, all forms of kind of realist representation, and that's travel writing, professional sociology and anthropology, um, any kind of field work, is that you're, of course, dealing with a dynamic of power. Who has the means to represent who? Why are they doing that? For what audience? You're creating knowledge about someone, even though in Ramel's work, he brilliantly kind of pushes off any neat conclusions um, that we can draw about these photographs and about a place and about a people. But one of the themes I see time and time again throughout this history is that in those relationships of power, historically, where the power has been imbalanced, there is resistance. Mm -hmm. That people oftentimes challenge the authority or the right of someone to intrude on their privacy that people oftentimes, and I try to make the case in capturing the South in the context of Jim Crow throughout the 20th century when it was white photographers by and large who felt like they had access to black communities, to black churches, to black neighborhoods, to black homes, um, but also to poor white neighborhoods and poor white homes, all in the name, whether it was social reform or it was um, ethnographic salvage, representing and capturing things before they're lost, that people oftentimes pushed back, that they wanted not to become an icon. They didn't want to become the object of someone else's art. They wanted to be their, uh, have their own um, personal identity. And, um, and so that theme of resistance is really all throughout this story. And I go back to someone I mentioned just a minute ago, and I want to use this as a jumping off point to talk about something else that Ramel mentioned. Um, Martha Strodwick Young, who I was talking about, one of the first primary popular documentarians of Hale County. Um, when she was collaborating with J.W. Otts in Hale County, she wrote a number of poems, and these were dialect poems. They were, you know, just some of the worst <laughs> manifestations of the sort of white Southern mind at the time and how they denigrate and dehumanize black lives. But Martha Strudwick Young, in a few of her dialect poems, in a really strange angle, chose to write poems from the perspective of black women who were very forceful in their refusal to not have their photograph taken by white photographers. And I had to ask myself, why is a white woman from Alabama in Hale County writing these poems from the perspective of black women who are basically saying, no, I do not want my picture taken. You will put it in a book 
the camera, the Kodak is worse than the devil, it's worse than the sheriff. Um, there was this sense, there was an embedded community knowledge of the dangers posed by the camera, particularly one wielded by a white photographer. James Agee, in fact, I'm going to quote Agee here, um, and then I'm going to turn it to Ramel. In Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, Agee talks a lot about the difference, how race shaped people's responses to the camera. Mm -hmm. A.G. talks about how the white tenant families he and Evans documented were kind of oblivious, at least the men were, to the presence of the camera and saw it as maybe an opportunity that they could somehow benefit from. Whereas A.G. said, the black people in Hale County saw the camera for what it was, which was a gun. And this is what um, A.G. said. Quote, and this is Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. I notice how much slower white people are to catch on the Negroes who understand the meaning of a camera, a weapon, a stealer of image and souls, a gun, an evil eye. And that put me in mind then of Susan Sontag and on photography where she famously calls photography a form of soft murder, a sublimated form of violence. Mm -hmm. And so my question for Hugh Ramel is given that fraught history, that history that is a absolute constant within the history of documentary in the South and within Hale County at every stage. The white, some of the women that A.G. and Evans tried to document refused to participate or would sabotage photographs. The families for years after went through court cases trying to um, sue publishers so they would not have to have the dignity of being the public face of white poverty in the South. So that history hangs over documentary work and particularly so in Hale County. And so I wonder, as you created this sort of, these deep bonds and relations, A, did you ever experience a kind of tension there as you were entering into people's private lives? And, or does that new dynamic and what you were bringing, a relational approach and you coming in as a black man, did that shape a bond that perhaps prior history did not have? Yeah, they're like such good questions and, um I was talking with my buddy Bobby uh, about Scott and some of the, the questions that he might ask. And I was like, the problem is, is that each question is a talk in itself. And that's the min a minimum, you know. Um, I definitely came across resistance more from people I didn't know because they didn't know my intentions. But there's also not a history of black people with cameras in the South, you know. And so, I mean, and obviously people have done this, black people have done this, um, and, and, and they have done it well, but the power is, and the fear is of the way in which white folks have used the camera. It's not the way in which black folks have used the camera. And um, I don't feel like that's articulated by people in the South. I just feel like it's sort of embedded in their, um, their sort of understanding of the world. And I, the most resistance I've come across are those who were just like, who is this, this random person in my neighborhood, if they hadn't seen me before, walking around with a camera? Is he here for insurance? Is he trying to get my social security taken? Like, is he here to try to disrupt? Um, otherwise, people are wildly interested, and they actually pine for a representation, and they would love to collaborate, and they're very interested in creative outlets. You know, we know um, the South in general is a bit uh, resourceless um, because of the powers that be sort of, you know, um, you know, purging of, of, of money or, or power or whatever for folks. But um, I found with, with my guys, because like, I think I, I sort of like when I talk to my documentary students or my art students or whatever, and it's, it's not really fair to say this to them, but I'm like, only make films of places and things you'd be doing anyway. Um, don't make, don't go, don't go make work. Because when you go make work, and it's just a thought experiment. I don't like you. Of course, you have to go make work. But your, your, the agenda of your aim and the way in which you're unaware, and I'm also unaware, the way in which you're unaware about the curation of your imagination is going to produce work that um, is going to do one thing that you wanted to do and nine things that you can't articulate that are reinforcing the rest, the problem of the image making and the problem of history. Um, and once again. It's an impossible task to ask, but for students to think about that, to think about 
whatever, whatever they're doing being part of their life experience being the fundamental moving anchor of the piece just means that they're coming with all of their truth and they're not, they're not projecting truth as much as some would when they're entering into a place and fundamentally it's transactional, you know? And so I didn't go to Hell County to make a film. I didn't go there to take photo to make images. I went there to teach and I was taking images um, and I got serious about it while I was there. And I had pretty serious relationships with Daniel and Quincy before I'd ever made a film, before I, I picked up the video camera. And you know, people sort of ask, how did you get this intimacy and you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, when you teach someone specifically in a GED program, they, you know, they've been, already been ostracized by um, an institution that you know, doesn't want to, to custom fit uh, a, a curriculum to them. So they're a little resistant to power. So you're coming into a place in which you have to make adjustments to the way in which you think you should teach, and they have to make adjustments to the way in which they think you're gonna teach and meet some common ground. Like that vulnerability produces a relationship. Same thing for coaching. I coach Daniel basketball, and if anyone has ever, um, I know you all have played sports, play sports, the higher level you get, the more you need direction and the more you have to be vulnerable and the more your coach also um, can meet you where you are. And that process produces a vulnerability and a connection. And those are the two things that filtered into us making the film. I, and we're speaking about the resistance, like I try to, sh to like make images all the time and always have my camera, but there's also a quarter of the time I put the camera down or I just didn't film it because it, to me it wasn't an appropriate time to be hanging out with the camera, people were arguing, people were, were you know, fighting, or someone was sad in a way that um, just didn't need to be represented in cinema, um, or didn't need to be represented in the film. In the film. Um, and so I think my fundamental hesitation about genuinely doing something, gosh, I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but I say this stuff comes from my experience and not from text, and I found the text to match my experience and then started working through there. I went to Ethiopia and made images that I used during artist talks that are the person going to the place and making the images and just going back and showing them. And they're just like poor uh, Ethiopians in this village. And some of them are just fucking gorgeous. And I, in the moment I was like, I am like, I don't know what magazine cover I'm gonna be on, but I tell you one thing, I'm gonna send one to all my friends, you know? And then I go home and I get home and I develop them and I'm like, shit, I think I just did the thing, you know? And being wrapped up in the beauty of the image and, and a person being willing to, though you're not quite sure their relationship to the moment because they're not articulating it. The ling there's a language barrier, which is so interesting for like, I love, uh, like the, the language in Scott's book is really enlightening for those who want to like really understand how documentary, one is the fundamental language for truth, but also how it's built on fantasy and a sort of dismissal of the, the intellect, the emotional range, and the psychology of those who are in front of the camera. You look at um, uh, some of the ways in which folks were resisting inside these images, and you're like, oh my God, and almost, you could argue, in all of the images, the people are acting, people are performing. So that means that the history of documentation is based on people believing that people are being authentic and people are performing, right? And then you think about the way that black folks um, specifically in the past have always had to alter their personalities to meet the white person's needs. And then the white person's needs, the white person believes that they're either a good person or, or their personality is based on this performance of meeting them and their needs. And so performance, what did I write? I wrote, um, 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 um. performance is the nature of blackness. Like, you know, and it's not that black people perform all the time now, like we're in the process of deeply understanding the, the, the deep consequences of being raced in a certain way and having to deal with this double consciousness and the, this complex psychology. And I always say caveats like this, it doesn't mean that other folks don't have similar double consciousnesses or, or white folks don't have their own version of this in their own family with their own dynamics, but specifically about blackness, it is all performance and and so is truth. And to understand that is to be able to, I believe, to use, which is the liberation. Like once you understand the Western philosophical logic to the document, then you're like, oh, meaning can be created in truth in such a variety of different ways um, and has been throughout the history of time until commerce produced an international logic, which is 
documentary, documentary film, which is uh, certain types of labels for what images can do and what sections of the world that they'll be in. I really appreciate that, that when you use the word vulnerability, I think that that captures, going back to what we were talking about with relational documentary, that in, in, in an unspoken and just deeply intuitive way, you, you get that sense of, of, of a bond, of a sense of ease, but also that, that mystery. Mm. Um, in looking at your photographs that, I mean, and I, and I mentioned this, if, if ever you have the chance, and there's a couple in my book, but if you're interested in the history of, of documentary work in Hale County and seeing what Ramel has done and why it is such a radical break, um, not only look at the photographs made by J.W. Otts, but also um, the only other photographer that made photographs of black people in Hale County, and again, Hale County was up until recently three quarters um, the population historically was black, was a Farm Security Administration photographer named Jack Delano. And um, he was there in 1941, the same year Let Us Now Praise Famous Men comes out. And there is this, this, this undercurrent of distrust, um, of unease. These are formerly beautiful photographs by one of my favorite FSA photographers. Um, and yet there is this sense that it's just an impermeable, impermeable barrier there. And that is in part the way in which Delano and others saw black people. They were in objects to an end in order to justify the New Deal programs um, rather than seeing them as human beings. And um, I think that just is, is very much evoked. That, vo that sense of vulnerability that is, is the nature of founding a relationship. And it's magic how it plays out in your images. Yeah. No, thank you. It's it's kind of accidental, you know. It's it's uh, yeah. I feel like it's it's based on disappointment in images that have come before. You know, it's just yeah. I don't know. Well, it, it reminded me. I mentioned a personal story as it relates to this, um, and are picking up with what you were talking about too. Um, I for a while I was teaching at Georgia State University in Atlanta. And while I was in Atlanta, I started a project um, documenting and recording um, some of the earliest forms of a cappella hymn singing in white and black primitive Baptist churches in Georgia and Florida. Mm. Um, it was called Lined Out Hymn Singing. Um, that's kind of beside the point. But it, it, during this, these few years, many Sundays, I was traveling, particularly in the middle and southwest Georgia, going to white and black primitive Baptist churches and particularly within the black primitive Baptist churches, had to build up relationships over years before I would even bring in a handheld recorder or a camera. Um, and I remember at one association, and associations were in all the churches from a geographical era come together. It's a family reunion in effect. And there was a photographer from a nearby university who wanted to come, had found out about it, and on his very first day there, a white photographer um, sets up his tripod and began shooting in the church, began asking people to walk around to the back of the church to photograph them. And they start walking up to me because he was white and I assumed that I knew him personally and were like, Scott, what, I mean, as graciously as they could, but the subtext was, what the hell are they doing here and why are they asking me to go around back to be photographed? And I just remember being at a total loss, just utterly shocked and mm. that experience of the hubris and just the, the, the sense of ownership that, of course, I am the artist, so therefore I have access to you in your most personal and sacred places, um, it just struck me. I mean, can you imagine a photographer showing up at your house or your family reunion and assuming that you were there to pose? And it was that experience that just opened up yeah. that new ways of seeing what was a, a constant thread and, um, and how just very, very different. Yeah, that entitlement is wild, you know? It like, is. the entitlement of the artist, you know? Yeah. Um, the entitlement of writers who write about their family members, you know? Like, I'm the artist, I'm a writer, I need to do this. Um, I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, but, like, there is sort of built in so much ego, and, and I have an ego. It's built, it's, like, Absolutely. part of, yeah, it's part of the process. Um, being super conscious of it is, I, I would hope to be, 
part of the future. I love, I love that analogy, not analogy, that, um, that anecdote, because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I love being honest. Like, I've done that before, you know? Like, I've, and it wasn't in Hell County, but, like, I've been like, oh, I'm just going to, like, at an event, you know, just like, you're, it's public, it's, it's, not, it's not against the law. Like, why is that the measure of whether or not the camera should be used that way, right. you know? It shouldn't be. Um, yeah. Well, this leads to um, a, maybe a last question, and then we can open it up, or if you have any other. Oh, I wanted to say something about, sure. um, you were saying about Jack Delano and, and taking photos and the sort of embedded resistance. Like, it, for me, I mean, I'm from, I was born in Germany. My dad's here. Hey, Dad, just got here. Um, I was born in Germany, raised in Northern Virginia, but lived in Chicago, lived in Bunch. My dad lived in, you know, um, was raised in North Carolina, born in North Carolina. Last night at dinner with everyone, we were talking about all of the crazy stuff that happened to him, and, and Danny was talking about a lot of stuff that happened to him in his youth. Um, and why am I saying this? Oh, I'm, I'm like not a Southerner. Um, I spent a bunch of time in New York, I mean, in North Carolina, because my dad would always take us and we'd hang out with all our families there. But my relationship to Hell County is trying to find, uh, it's a site of meaning, you know? It's, uh, it's part of what I consider, or what I would like to see, and people have talked about it before me, is like the reverse migration, which is black folks going back to the South and now claiming the land that I would argue is at least half ours, you know, minimum. Um, and and participating in the sort of uplifting and all these really good social things. But um, you can't make meaningful work without a place to have as part of the cosmology of meaning, right? right? Like making something in isolation um, and there's nothing tethered to it, then it, what does it mean, right. you know? And so thinking about this place as uh, the origin of blackness and, and using the work, the tangible work and the tangible history of Walker Evans and all these folks as jumping off points to talk about other issues and talk about the complexity of what it really means to be in the world, at least in this moment, um, is kind of the big, the big project and where I think a lot of these folks are most useful. Um, putting anything in contact with this creates meaning, you know? Um, and that's kind of what, I, I mean, I, I, when I read your book, I was just like, where was this, you know? Because it, there's just not a consolidation and a, a track to be like, like Walker Evans had influences. Who, who knows Walker Evans' influences? Like, it's not a thing. It was people who sketched the houses. Right. Like he went, he saw these, he's like, oh, like I'm a photographer. And he was very non-political in his work, although it ended up being politicized. Um, it's another conversation. But knowing the origin of inspiration and representation, which is, basically like the arc and everything's a conversation, an ongoing long conversation, um, is I think the only, you're not asking me these questions, I'm just saying, it's like the only way to sort of get out of, to like change the trajectory. Yeah. Unsolicited, sorry. Well, I have a response to that and then I'll, I'll ask you one more question. Um, just as the beginning we were talking about you, uh, again, the way I see it, your work, or at least an important thrust of your work, is this relational quality with the people that mm -hmm. you're documenting. But it's also what you were saying there, that it's also relational and that I see your work and how you've talked about your work as an expression of how you, as Ramel Ross, as a black man, as a person connected to this history, to the historic South, um, it's work about how you relate to a place rather than you making a statement about a place. Yeah. And that's a really, yeah. I, I see that as a really important distinction. And I think you've, you've spoken about it so eloquently and it's made me rethink a whole lot about the documentary tradition. But I think that's a really important thing to take from this is that um, that process mm. of, of thinking critically about how place shapes identity and shape, place shapes destiny um, in that the documenter, a documentarian should be a part of a process of discovery in relation to how place shapes who we are, and you do that brilliantly. And yeah, so I'm getting really excited now. Um, yeah, that like, that reminds me, which is something I wrote down at the beginning, like, I, d I was in this show called But Still It Turns, um, curated by Paul Graham, who I love as an image maker. I was at ICP, it was up for a long time. Showed the film there, 
bunch of images, and this critic wrote about the show. And what he wrote about, um, I'm not sure if all you all are familiar with the image Yellow, which is um, uh, a young girl named Ni Nyla, um, who Curtis like, is right across the street from my house, just like behind a bush doing some stuff. I'm on this side, and she's, you know, I think it might be in the Ogden collection, I'm not sure. Um, the guy wrote about that image, and he said, in Ramel's images, you can see perseverance, and there is beauty and diversity. And then he said, um, he took a photo of a girl hiding behind a bush. Now, that really upset me, because she wasn't hiding. I saw her from over there. I hit her, right? That's what the camera does. The camera makes the decision, the camera does the thing, and it produces the logic based on whatever the photographer wants. Now, the photographer may not have made the decision for everything to happen, but that's one perspective of it. From over there, it looks completely different. And when he said that, to me, I was like, you're misunderstanding what should be the conversation about what the camera is doing. It's the person holding it, and it's their intention, it's all the things. It's not documenting what's there, because what's there is more everything else than the point that you're standing in. There's an infinite more perspectives than the point that you're looking at the thing. So why is this the one? Because you're doing it, you know? Um, and that ties to when I got to Hell County, I, I did this little writing piece, and I took a photo of some guys, and it went into some newspaper, and a woman, a couple people from town, like, were upset about the image. And they were like, and, and some of the language I use, this is not my Hell County. It was in the Huffington Post and stuff. I would, I would, I'd use it during artist talks. Um, that was a breakthrough. It was right before I took the Keisha Marquise. And I was just like, one, I can't satisfy these folks. And I was like, yeah, this isn't your Hell County because you don't hang out with any of the black people. Right. All you do is like live this life and everyone else lives over here and I'm living over here with these folks and this is what I'm living. And so, of course this isn't your Hell County. Um, because you don't think Hell County is more than your experience of it. Right. Um, and that's a big problem with the way that people legislate the world, you know? Absolutely. So last thought slash question, um, and that is, I know when you got to Hale County, you were beginning to teach photography. And I wonder, and maybe this is something I don't quite know that's already in existence, or maybe that is being planned or, or has a future. Um, is there, and it's always struck me, because I know there are other places, I, if you're familiar with Apple Shop, if you're familiar with documentary work, um, believe it or not, during the Nixon administration, um, War on Poverty programs funded a lot of things called community film workshops, and in a place like Appalachia, that was renowned for being seen as a problem place where documentary photographers and filmmakers came in. It, Apple Shop was an effort to kind of flip the power and to give the cameras to local people to document their own lives and not have it be outsiders doing it. Um, and I wonder, is there an effort, I mean, you've been spearheading this by teaching local people photography, but of having local people not only make photographs, but circulate photographs, circulate their work with them, mm. within a broader community so that it's, it's, it's coming, it, it's their Hell County that's also being shared. Yeah, you know, not yet. Um, I, I love the possibility of that. I think um, I have some really big plans with um, my good friend Jocelyn Barnes, who's here, and I, I imagine like those ideas will eventually make it into some of the things that we're considering. I think now my goal is to like have enough of 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 a, a sort of respect for people to trust that I can uh, I can produce projects of the scale that I would like um, with these things embedded in it. Because I think a lot of times when you focus on if if I were to take on a, a project, I would get so obsessive about it that would be a ten year thing. And then that would be, which would be awesome for those who participated in it and for greater reasons, but then that would be it. Right. So in my mind, because I, I think on like longer terms, um, in terms of like how things can move around so that the most can be done for a place, at least while I have the ability to help, to, to participate in making things, um, the order of operations, you know? Um, and is your future work gonna remain rooted in Hale County? Oh, I committed to Hale County in 2012. 
I was like, I'm going to make all of my work here because no one else has, right. you know? And that's, to me, the, like the power of work. My, the, best, the work that I like the most is the work that is iterative and over long spans of time and can change and, and all those things. And so um, there's something I wanted to say that um, I thought would have been interesting, but I get so lost when you're talking because it's so smooth. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, it's good. It's like, uh, yeah. I don't know. I'll, I'll probably remember when someone asks a question, but yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Like how, oh, this is what I wanted to say. And this is like, this realization was really important to me. And this has to do with people making images and people posting images online is that everyone participates in the colonial aesthetic. Like everyone makes images like my favorite thought experiment, which I can't even get beyond just the phrase because it's really difficult. Like, what if, what if the camera was born in a, diff a different culture? What if the logic of the camera was born in a polytheistic uh, religion? What if it was not born to this God figurehead? What if it was born to the Buddhist, who have their own problems, right? What if it was born to the, the, uh, those who are Hindu? Like, how would they have brought the camera into the world? Like, the camera is Christian to me, you know? We use it, and I, I think Christianity is great. Done great things for the world. Um, so I'm not poo-pooing on, um, on Christianity, but, like, it's a tough thing to grapple because we use the camera the way we use the camera because that's what it does. I was taught that the camera points to what's important. You know, it makes something important by pointing at it. But for Hell County this morning, this evening, we're like, well, what if it's not pointing? What if it's participating? What if it's floating? What if it's in the world as a consciousness? What if it's an organ? Um, and so when I think about people making images now, um, I remember something I read, Bell Hooks, a Bell Hooks line, which was that the, the only site for resistance in the like, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, relatively only site um, against colonial image making of black folks is the Black Family Album. It's the only place, because that's where you just have the camera, you're just snapping photos of your family. It's not going up to this place. There's no intention aside from remembering, and it's for you and your family. Um, so after, like, to me, that was like a profound statement. And then you think about the way that the internet had allowed people to upload their family albums and share them, and all of a sudden, Black family albums became accessible by every person in the world, right? Wow, we get to see what it's like, the inside of the black family. Nothing profound, it's just the inside of a family. But anyway, the images didn't exist out there. But those images became tethered to a system of likes. Right. And, that, that, and they became tethered to a system of commerce. And when that happened, the images became, became not about the unseen and the personal, they became about the public and the attention. And then it just participates in the same capitalistic thing that has produced the documentary world as we know it. And so I'm, I'm hesitant and really, I'm hesitant about projects where people have full control over the camera themselves, which sounds a little hypocritical given the way in which I, I work with folks, but like I haven't figured out a way, for, to, a strategy to work against the way in which people can make images that they think are good and are good in short term but potentially have deeper problematic implications if you want to like really analyze it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, you, you mentioned, um, I don't know if you're, I'm not on Instagram a lot, but there's a, a one place I follow called Black Archives. Mm. You know that one? Is that Lau Ashton Harris? I don't know for sure. Mm. Um, but they, they will find video footage of like college reunions and college parties or family footage from family um, can you share that with? Can you yes, share that I with will. Me? But yeah. also, I mean, people who found family, black family photographs, black family photo albums, and, and as you said, and just the liking of it, but then the, the comments in it, and yeah. how they're all very well meaning, mm -hmm. and yet it, it, it's, like you said, it's turning this into another product of consumption that val it validates their preconceived notion yeah. rather than a relationship to the people who are there as someone. It, it, there's almost an easy sense that I know this, and so therefore it fits into this cosmic view I have of yeah. who black people are, and it's kind of unsettling. But, yeah, because yeah. I, I, I think about the, 
the sort of black representational space of images as like a really big ocean that's calm and everyone's making images and there's so many images out there and you're like, oh, but there's a crazy strong undertow that is pulling the direction and the undertow is from the past that is making things go in a certain direction, but it looks like everyone's just making images and all the images are fine and they're just going there, but they're, they're not. They're, they're, they're still building up on the sort of soot of um, racist gaze and yeah, got to figure out a way um, around that. And I think that archive project is, is, a, re is a great start, you know, but then I'll, how do you, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, you want to see yeah let's see what people, um, yeah. people want to ask. Hey, Beverly. Yes. Fun night um, last night, huh? Uh, <laughs> for me, for me, we had a, yeah. Yes. <laughs> my, my Broadway friend here is making me hold the mic correctly. Okay. <laughs> so, um, as, as we talked about yesterday, uh, you and I are products of a military upbringing. Mm -hmm. And I know you say you are doing all of your work now in Hale County, Alabama, but to me, you have two other interesting avenues that I would enjoy and that is for me growing up in the military was the great equalizer that mm. probably saved me as a child of Mississippi from lapsing into behavior that I would have not have been happy with. So the concept of black folks and white folks in the military whether it's at the enlisted man officer thing or the families would be so provocative to me to see that. And the other thing is the rarefied air of Georgetown or George Washington, you said, and Brown University mm -hmm. versus Howard, just or Jackson State, let's take a real school. To me, Howard is Harvard, and mm -hmm. Jackson State is more like the type of schools I grew up with. Yeah. So why, why would you, or would you ever consider looking at one of those two venues? Are you pretty plugged in to your future direction? Beverly, I talk a big game, but I'm like, <laughs> I mean, come on, let's be serious, guys. Right. Everyone, you know, just kidding. Um, no, when I say that I want to make all my work in Hell County, it means that I'm going to be working in Hell County forever. Um, I, I've, like, I have other projects that I'm doing in some other states and some film stuff, and um, to me, I want to focus my, uh, you know, a good portion of my creative energy there and a good portion of my resources um, and network to projects in this space. Um, and I think I kind of like only photographing there. I've actually only photographed there as like a kind of conceptual um, political constraint. But I'm going to be doing a bunch of stuff. And I, the military is really complicated to me. Um, it, you know, got my dad out of poverty, my mom out of poverty. Um, but at the same time is, you know, uh, stop one for indoctrination and, uh, you know, a, a type of patriotism that's um, more, more nefarious than it is bolstering. So, um, and I love, like, I'm, I'm making work right now. Bobby and I, Bobby, who my studio manager, good, good guy, helped me make all the work in the show. We, um, I'm, I'm deeply an athlete at heart, and I get a lot of my logic of using the camera and photography and thinking of time and space and movement and, and, and future-oriented projections and speculation and um, spatial intelligence from sports, which translates to art. Um, and we have some stuff that we're thinking about within the concepts of trying to like really almost, almost prove to people that athletes are time travelers um, and they are geniuses of time and space that is either pre or post language and um, are just kind of wrapped up in a culture um, and a, a type of being in the world and a celebrity that like presents a certain type of um, behavior that is looked down upon but is just as smart as the Einstein in terms of their ability to manipulate time and space. Like, the guys that I play basketball with, like the stuff that, I mean, you all have, like, I'm sure there's some serious athletes here. And, and it's just like unbelievable. It's unbelievable the way that people can move intuitively um, for, an, for an end goal. Um, and and that, I think that that needs form, you know? So I'll definitely be doing more stuff, basically. Yeah. Hey, Ramel, Dale. 
Hey, there. Um, can you talk a little bit about the trajectory of your work and what we saw in, we, in this actually incredibly beautiful show and you're beginning to go in a bit of, you know, sculpture, mm. very tactile sort of earthen work. work. Could yeah. say a little bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking that. That's a tough question because I'm like, I think I'm, I've been thinking about this stuff for a while and haven't had time to do it because of teaching and the film and other things. But, you know, to me, the return to home for people of color, like myself and, and those who are actually part of the great, the literal, literally part of the great migration, is um, looking at the South as uh, creating your own South, right? Like taking that, the pain, taking the stories and taking the whatever and then building up a new collective myth um, that can be the new meaning-making foundation adjacent to oppression and the slavery, which is the origin, um, and that can be the sort of home. Like, to me, you can't leave home until you've been there, you know? Um, and so everyone left, but, like, most people haven't been. People are still afraid to go to the South. My, my girlfriend at the time, when I moved, her father was like, why are you going there? And don't go. It's dangerous, you know? Um, and I went there, I realized it was more dangerous for a white liberal than it was for a, a relatively smart black man because I'm no threat. You know, I don't have any money. They don't think I have any money. I don't think I can do anything. Um, and so with the sculpture, all of my work has been like, I think conceptually based in the idea of the document, right? Like there's a safe up in the show that I bought a house in 2017 in Rhode Island. Um, just me buying a house in Rhode Island, there's a safe that is locked, the lever's broke, the dial's broke, you can't get in. I eventually get in after like a year of just like chipping away. And inside of that safe was like 920 rounds of ammunition, Confederate flag, gloves, some other weird shit. And there's this jewelry box, keepsake box, um, Sam named, opened it, and inside it said, the South will rise again. Like what? I randomly got a safe in a house, and this is what was inside. There was police issue grade ammunition in that safe. Like, we, but we know this is, you know, it's embedded in culture, but like, to me, making work with that material is like what I'm interested in, right? Like, that is a document. That is evidence that, to me, the process of playing with it in artistic form is almost like a William Christian Berry, like a way of dealing with the, the devastation of it and presenting it in a way that can be um, appreciated, absorbed, contemplated um, without being a one-liner. Because all this stuff is a one-liner. Racism kills people. Blackness is this. This is the nation. Like we know, we know the problems. The problems haven't changed, you know? They're just getting more complex. And so art is a space to make the things complex and aesthetic. Um, so that uh, they float, um, they don't sink, you know, um, they don't become trite. And the earth, Hale County, the earth, it's so rich, it produced so much joy and so much commerce and so much industrial thrust, but it also is, um, you know, a, the bastion, a, a bastion of blood. It's just like, how many people, why is that soil red? Obviously because of the um, alkaline and these other things, but like it's pretty bloody too. Like it has so many different connotations, and it's so it's it's basically using the using objects as documents to to like make experience in the context of of things that are too difficult to talk about directly, but can be felt in a way that uh, will participate in in you internally for the rest of your life. Hello, uh, my name is Jason. Uh, What's up, Jason? Wanted to ask a quick question, particularly about you spoke about relationships, mm -hmm. uh, and I think the fabulous thing about documentary photography is that you can return to it over and over. You can kind of stay with these people for a long time, and thinking a lot about the uh, people that you've had a chance to photograph and you know uh, capture in your film. Uh, are you ever? Well, have you ever had a situation where folks know that they don't want to meet your camera that day? They tell you, you know, it's either not today, you know, 
And I'm thinking of, you know, in the time that you have developed the, these relationship with these folks, they know when they can tell you when and when not they don't want to meet you. Yeah. Uh, and they're meeting you, but they're also meeting the camera. But there are times when they know and they tell you, hey, I need to meet the camera right now, you know? And so uh, could you just share a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I mean, there's only one time Daniel said, looked at me and said, don't record this. And I was like, damn, you know? Um, I can't speak for them, you know? Like, it's not, it's not possible. Uh, so I don't really ever know what's going on in their heads. I only know based on my desire to be truth, not truthful, my desire to be respectful and all of those kind things that people should be with folks. Um, I know Boosie, when Boosie doesn't want to be recorded, she leaves. I don't follow her, you know? Um, and she's left before, and I felt that she just didn't want to be recorded at that moment. Um, I still recorded Quincy, you know? No one's ever told me to stop, aside from Daniel that one time, and I stopped. We didn't, ref we like hung out for a couple more hours. He called me the next day. No, you know what he said? He didn't say stop, he said, I don't want to make this documentary anymore. That's what he said. And this was year five. He had just gotten in a really big fight with his mother. It was really stressful. I was stressed out. We were in the car, which is where we talk, because it's best sound, the best sound. It's really <laughs> like a little sound studio. And then I stopped recording. I was like, I was kind of devastated. I was like, he doesn't want to make the documentary anymore? Um, damn. And then he texted me the next day, like, yo, we shooting today? You know? Um, I think for these guys, I imagine, like when I first got to, gosh, I'm, I'm kind of rambling on this one, but when I first got to Hell County, my first, one of my first thoughts was like, whoa, they don't, they don't interact with a lot of people. They just don't interact with a lot of people. You're in New York, you walk out, you know, if you fall, at least a thousand people will step over you. You fall in the South, you may not be stepped over for two or three days. That sucks, you know? And like, I think that they, I think, and I know they do, because they told me, like they love the attention. They love the conversation. They love having me, who has a, um, a not their perspective on the world, you know, talking shit to them, or being their mentor, or being their friend, or hanging out. And so I feel like they all have, they all feel empowered to make decisions on when not to be in front of the camera, or to tell me stop. I think the reason why I haven't got any is because I'm really aware and cautious of it. And ultimately, I mean, I talk to Jocelyn about this all the time. I'm like, I could never repay Daniel and Quincy for letting me in their lives. Like, you know, how, how can, you know, I make the film, it leads to all these opportunities, which I do something with, and I do another opportunity, I do this, and all of a sudden, I have this really great life, but their life is the same, you know? Like, how do I repay, how do I, and the only way I can, um, which is not necessarily based on the possibility for my life to become exponentially more, more um, me to have more control over it, but is to like be part of theirs and to be their friends and to continue to um, make them symbols of the families that we know of in the past and the meaning making locations that we revere to be historically significant. I think to do that with their families and to do that with Hell County in a new way um, is, is like a really great thing to be able to try to do. So to answer your question, I feel, like they, I feel like all of them know the ways to make sure I don't record if they don't want to. And I think they, I know they all feel comfortable telling me. I mean, we, they, they, they make fun of me. Like we're friends. It's not like, they're like, you know, it's not a transaction in that way. They are like, why are you being so goofy or that doesn't make any sense? Like they're, they talk back to me. So I think we have that. Yeah. You can also say, I would like paragraph response, <laughs> two pages, <laughs> or I would like, uh, Ezra, uh, what is Ezra Pound? I would like an Ezra Pound. Yeah. Well, that's making sense. Um, 
Great show, very thought-provoking, but I really would like to hear about you shipping yourself in a box from <laughs> Rhode Island to uh, Hale County. Yeah. What you learned and why. I really why wanted Kasimu. Kasimu here? Oh, Kasimu left. Messed up, Kasimu. I thought we were boys. <laughs> no, he was here. Um, yeah, the box, the box ship. You know, I don't know if I'm, I'm like, uh, ready to talk about it. I don't know if I'll ever be, you know? Um, because it was, it's like, I don't want to, I mean, it's a, romantic, it's a romantic gesture, I think, to try to do that with control, um, to make a sort of statement about the, what people of color are willing to do to write, to, to, to rewrite a possible future, um, and to return to a place that was so devastating, yet I would argue holds the key to being truly liberated. Um, I don't know, I don't know what it was like because it was, I was so present, you know? And I, I, when I got out of the box, I, Ron knocked on the, the thing. I was like, they gone? I popped out, we talked for a minute, and I started making work for the show. You know, like I didn't, I didn't go sit on my couch and like, whoa, I just traveled for 60 hours in a box. Like I haven't stopped in a really long time. Um, so I haven't processed it. It was scary, um, and it was invigorating. Um, and yeah, maybe I'll be able to, to say like more interesting things in like a couple months when I can like really, it was, dream, it was like surreal, I, almost like it didn't happen. Obviously it happened, do you know what I mean? Like when you parachute and you're like, damn, I parachuted. And you can still feel a little bit of it, but yeah, how do you, how do you talk about falling terminal velocity without a poem and a lot of time to edit the words? You know. All right. Uh, <laughs> Richard. Question. Huh? Richard up. Never thought about it till now. I could if I. Oh, I would love to be treasurer of the U.S. I'd give everyone here money. I would be like. I would change the currency to black. Just kidding. <laughs> nah, I mean, not really. I mean, I, yeah, that's, it's, that's, a, that's really interesting. Yeah. Politics. <laughs> Politics. Oh, yeah, I don't have an answer. I don't know. I really, yeah. I almost worked for the State Department. I did work for the State Department. We'll talk about that. I think he finds. Say, so, um, I'm Alan, and and I, 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 I understand, I get a, the radical break with Christenberry in your work, but I'm also struck by the parallel that he spent so many years on Hale County, and you are as well. Do, do you, would you say something about, about your relation, your, your consciousness about your relation to Christenberry and his work, mm. and the parallel that's obviously there? Yeah. Yeah, I love that question. If if those if there are some who didn't hear it, it, it was uh, about Christian Berry's relationship to time and place. He came back to Hale County. He was born there, I think, right? Tuscaloosa. Born in Tuscaloosa. Family, was family from Hale County or ha family from yeah Hale County, and then photographed many years the same, sometimes the same street, sometimes the same building. Um, I wrote a thing about Christian Berry, which I think best articulates my understanding of his work, and I think I think one. One, uh, one line that I, I took me a really long time to articulate, which is what I, which is what I feel about it, which was, is that like Christian Berry isn't interested in the photograph. He's interested in, he's no more interested in the photograph than a scientist is who takes an image through the Hubble telescope. He's not interested in that. He's interested in the this, and this is the marker of the this. And it's constantly moving, which is why he came back, which is why the scientist takes another picture of the star next year when the technology is a little better, or when they have a little bit better understanding of what stars are around it. Um, and I see that in Christian Berry's sculptures in which he's just like, he brings it down to here, and he's like, now Hell County can go everywhere. Now it can move, and he can move it to a different place. And so I think my relationship to his is, is based on time, and it is based on not deifying the image. Right, like, I love the image, I love it. 
it does so much, but it's, that's only an entry point, and that's only a trampoline and a trap door. That's not the thing. It's, it's on your way to the thing. Um, and I feel that about, I feel like Christian Mary knew that intuitively um, if, he, if he never said it out loud to anyone. Um, at least that's how I like to think about his work. Hi. Hello. Hey, hey, Ramel. Hey, Scott. Um, <laughs> Richard. Is that it with questions? Thanks so much. That was great. Um, Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming, yeah. everybody. And Ramel, were you going to go and hang out in the gallery a little? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I was cool. actually going to take, I need a little time. I want to take um, uh, my friend who had, I would argue, was going to be called the best exhibition of the generation, uh, Dirty South, uh, you know, Sonic Impulses of the South, Valerie, who is, d should not be bothered, but she's here. And I want to take her to look at some of the work, so I'll go over there. Okay, great. Um, but... Uh, why did I say that? Yeah, can I just thank uh, Scott? His book is yep. so yeah. synthesized. It's so nice. Um, and Richard, and William, and Bobby, and whatever, you guys know. Yeah. Thank you, Ramel. Thanks, Scott.